What's up, friends, and welcome to another episode of Elevate and Thrive. And if you've ever wondered about gluten or celiac disease, then this is the episode for you. I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Angela Yeagley. Hello, everyone. And we have recently put out some content on gluten sensitivity and gluten testing, and it got a lot of response. There was a lot of questions. People had a lot of sharing, and so we thought we'd take an opportunity to sit down and Fill in some of the blanks, some of the questions that people ask, and talk a little bit about celiac and talk just about gluten sensitivity. So, so this is like a, I would say, a top question that I get. And also, interestingly enough, I feel like it's also something that people don't quite believe in. And I you know that sounds strange, but, but when people come in, you know, I think because it's become such a popular topic that people almost think it's made up, you know. Like my going coming in and going, you know, my friend can't have you know lotion that has gluten in it. Can't share the same pan that you know has gluten in it, and and I think it's ridiculous. And you kind of go, well, you know, let's talk about how this all came about, right? Like, why why is the gluten allergy like such a popular allergy for people to have? Like, you know, it is I think right to question, but actually there are answers for that. Yeah, let's get into it because. It is, you know, one of those things that makes you wonder, like, is it real? But, you know, we've been asking that questions about aliens for a long time. You know, <laughs> we, we know that, too. The answer is yes. The answer seems to be pointing towards a yes. So, well, you know, I'm just going to say, you know, suspend disbelief here. And if you are you know, currently dealing with a gluten sensitivity or, or even with a full diagnosis of celiac disease, then we're hopefully going to provide some insights into treatment options and ways that you can go about getting help and how we approach it here at Sage. Right. Maybe let's go back, though, like 10,000 years ago. Exactly. Yes, that's where we need to begin. Strangely enough, 10,000 years ago. So that is the time that humans started to integrate basically agriculture into their food sources. And so that is when we started to cultivate grains at that time. And, and of course, you know, as time went on, as the thousands of years, you know, marched forward to, to getting close to this present time. I mean, yes. Progress, yeah. Technological improvement. Exactly, yes. And so there became, you know, a greater use. It became easier to mill flour, and so people used it more, right? More mouths to feed. Processing yeah. allows, you know, finite resource to become an almost infinite resource with a food because you can distill it down, repackage it, turn it into other stuff, put it on a shelf, put it in a box, ship it around the world, ship it across the country, whatever. And so that's kind of the rise of the modern food system. Right, exactly. And so we started seeing... What's interesting, in the medical literature, they started seeing a reference to wheat belly even back, like, starting in the late 1800s and, and then, of course, going on into the, you know, the 1900s that, that documented cases of, I mean, they would call it, they would call it grain belly or wheat belly. And so people like to think that the, a problem with gluten or wheat is, is this is a modern thing and it's not, you know, it's, it's allergy or intolerance to this. Has been around for a long time, right? Similar to, I mean, just like there are some people who are allergic or have an intolerance for dairy, you know, ever since, you know, same kind of deal, right? It's like, Absolutely, so, yeah. so you can make the argument, well, has some of that stuff picked up because of the prevalence of various, you know, additives and food processing techniques in the end, and just environmental toxins, environmental stress that probably makes just allergens in general more common today as the body is really stressed more. Yeah, that all makes sense. And I'm sure that, you know, if you want to really geek out on this, there's probably some really great documentaries on Netflix. They're absolutely decorated. Yeah. (laughs) The whole thing. But suffice to say, we're now at the spot where a significant portion of the population deals with this, whether it's a celiac situation or whether it's a gluten sensitivity. So maybe let's talk a little bit about the difference between those, because I think when, you know, people have questions about gluten, I think sometimes that is around the severity, you know, and this idea of gluten gluten intolerance or an allergy to gluten versus like celiac disease. You know, those are two different things. They are two different things. Yes. And what's interesting, one thing I want to point out that just I wanted to see what was out there on this topic. So I'm looking around and what I found really fascinating is that on the, the internets, you know, basically when you search, like, can you be tested for a gluten allergy versus celiac? And and a lot of the sites say no. So I really want to clarify that because that's not true, actually. And so the difference between when we're looking at a gluten intolerance, right, or a sensitivity compared to celiac, 
gluten intolerance is going to be a, a allergy reaction, and that can be with something called IgG or IgA. And I won't get too much into that. Just know that those are things that can be tested. They're gliadin antibodies, IgG and IgA. And those can be positive in both celiac and in both gluten intolerance, right? So now what differentiates the two? You get this test back and you're like, well, okay, I just did those antibodies, the gliadin antibodies, and I'm positive, right? Really part of it's going to be how high are those? You know, so there's going to be a set number. Now a basic lab is going to say, hey, if you're over 15, say for instance, this is likely celiac, right? But what if you're nine? So in standard medicine, they'll say, oh, look, this is completely negative. You have no problem at all. You don't have celiac and you don't have, there's nothing wrong with gluten, right? That's not true, right? So if you are showing a positive antibody, that means there is an issue. It might not be celiac, but it's a gluten intolerance of some sort, right? And it's more likely to be more severe the higher that number is. So now moving on into celiac, so say if I get something back and I'm like, well, that's a significant number, maybe it's not above 15, or maybe it is, or maybe it's close, depending on their symptoms, our next step to diagnose celiac, or at least start to get an idea if you might have it, is to look for these autoantibodies. They're, I'll say them, even though people, you know, obviously you need to talk to your doctor, they're tissue transglutaminase and they're endomesial antibodies. So if you're positive for those, the likelihood that you have celiac is high. We really need to go a step further, and there's genetic testing, and it's called HLA. There are specific ones that you look at for celiac, and so that can be done through your normal lab. And so if those are positive, those are also, there's a strong likelihood because it's like if, if one of those gene types are positive, it's like a 98%, not over a 98, oh, it's like almost like 98.9% chance that the type of gluten allergy you have or antibodies is for is celiac, right? So... So, but really the gold standard, I just want to say this will be in standard medicine right now, the gold standard is you technically are not diagnosed with celiac until you have a, an intestinal biopsy. And that shows that you are having an autoimmune reaction to the gluten. And that's the difference, essentially. Like, so the difference between a gluten allergy and having celiac is that when now somebody can have gluten and be extremely sick from it, like they feel awful. And we're going, I know we're going to talk about symptoms related to that. And I mean, maybe feel like, like, you know, like I'm going to die. Like this stuff is horrible. <laughs> and, but then we do all the antibodies. We do the celiac testing. We do the genes and everything's negative. And it's like, well, the likelihood without you going and getting an intestinal biopsy, everything else is negative. The likelihood, this is just intolerance. This isn't celiac, right? But they're like, I feel horrible. Yes, you can feel horrible. This is the difference between really, to boil it down, it's the difference between your body having a reaction versus your body having an autoimmune attack essentially is yeah exactly so if you those antibodies are positive and you have those other markers what's happening is when you have gluten it's going a step further it's actually creating like severe damage in the lining of your intestine because of your immune system is trying to kill it yeah your immune system is going berserk and right. damaging your body and damaging your intestines yeah so you mentioned some of the symptoms this is always you know and you also mentioned a ton of testing and so just like anything you know part of what we do here in our job is to play detective a little bit and to ask a series of questions and to use very specific testing to try and get to the root cause and the understanding of what's really happening because it can be complicated. There can be sometimes multiple factors going in or multiple other situations that are showing up and it makes it look like one thing when it's actually another. But generally speaking, when we look for symptoms, what are we looking for or would a person be experiencing that might tell them, hey, you should come in and get this checked out? Yeah. So what's really interesting, I mean, a lot of people like to think that it's it's gut. So it can be the gut. You know, you can be experiencing bloating and and loose stool and constipation and nausea and abdominal pain and sometimes vomiting like it could be any of those things right however what's really interesting once you've been on a food for long enough many times the body starts it starts adapting right and we we like essentially it starts coming out in other ways and so a lot of times when people come, first come in and I'm running a full panel on them and I'm like has anybody ever just at least checked this on you you know they have fatigue they have headaches they have all these other things like, you know, we're going to screen it and it's positive. They, a lot of times they're like, oh, my gut's, you know, I'm, I'm pooping every day. It's not loose. Like I'm, you know, I'm fine. And so how gluten is affecting them is they're exhausted. You know, they, their body aches. You know, they have some weird rashes. They have like mood issues. You know, they have depression, anxiety. They have 
you know, their their nervous system is really tapped. So maybe they're starting to, because it causes B vitamin depletion, they're getting neuropathy or, or you know, loss of feeling. I would say fatigue is is a big one, you know, that we use. Like, it's like, let's screen this if you're extremely tired. And it can even go as far as there's a lot of damage in the intestines. We can see anemia associated with it, usually B vitamin deficiency. But depending on the severity, there could be iron issues too. So, so what you're saying is it really goes way way beyond just the gut thing. That, Absolutely, that a lot of times people maybe think of bloating, constipation, diarrhea, that kind of thing. Yeah, and it can show up in all of these other ways. Well, and you know what's really fascinating? You would think somebody who's celiac is always going to have like the worst of everything. They're going to have the worst of everything. No, actually, that's not true. It's What's really fascinating, I have people who are celiac, I have the worst antibodies. They have everything is positive, right? The genes are positive, everything. And I'm like, you absolutely, this is a, this is done. Like there is no gluten for you. Like there's no even, you know, no sampling. Yeah. yeah don't even look at the gluten. Like they're the people that you got to read the labels on your lotions. They're the, the person who's like, all right, family, I've got my own, you know, pan. Nobody can use it. Nobody can use this. And what's really fascinating, there are times when they don't really notice much of anything. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how is that even possible? Yeah, this just goes back to how unique and kind of just individual people's different experiences and, and whatnot. But these are at least some broad symptoms that you can be thinking of and questioning if you're wondering, yeah. hey, is this something I should look into? And so if you are questioning and you are thinking about looking into that, you mentioned a number of different testings and different like ways to start why don't we just real quickly walk through how it kind of works if you want to come in yeah so so essentially you would we need to we need establish care and then really we just need to start with some blood work so i would just do those it's all through blood so gliadin antibodies i would start with that i mean there's really no need start with the basic yeah unless somebody you know unless somebody is like they had their symptoms are so severe like they're having a lot of gut symptoms that are that are you know, they have been going on a long time and they're very severe, it's like, okay, we might decide to go ahead and just add on those celiac gene, you know, the celiac panel. But starting with the gliadin antibodies is really, that's really the easiest way to do it, the IgG, IgA. And it's a simple blood test and can be done just through Quest or LabCorp. Doesn't have to be specialty. It's, it's easy. And you can request that from your primary too, just to say, you know, I am having all these symptoms. I've now heard this podcast. I've been educated. You know, please order these for me. You know, and if you know, probably for your primary, if you've got some gut symptoms, that's going to help. Yeah, and if they laugh in your face or you know mm -hmm. kick you out of their office, come see us, and yeah. we'll make sure we listen to your to your situation and and ask the appropriate questions, and really, of course, look to make sure that we do the right steps in the beginning to start to diagnose something that can a lot of times go undiagnosed because how the, the traditional or normal standardized testing looks at some of these values. So this is definitely something, if you've had the sneaking suspicion or you're wondering, and maybe you've been tested in the past and, you know, it was inconclusive, this is something here that we specialize in. So it is worthwhile potentially to come in and talk about it some more. Yeah, would love to. Yeah, please come in. And, and then once you have the diagnosis, you know, of either the intolerance or the celiac, then we have a whole plan for you as well. Like that's the next step on the protocol of gut healing, right? And then you know, helping you understand all the things that gluten can be in and that you look to avoid. And usually we have people start with like elimination and challenge, right? So it's, I mean, they're there. If you're, if you're just intolerant, there can be some flexibility there, you know, just depending on how severe. Totally. And that's where we work with you on a personalized plan and help you establish those parameters and those boundaries, as well as the just different nutritional support or the different vitamins, mineral support or therapies that we have here that we can deploy that can really help dial things in for you so that you know you're in a spot where you're you know it's the right spot it's the sweet spot that yeah. is kind of for you that might mean never having gluten again or that might mean that there's a certain tolerance that you have and if you go beyond a certain threshold with the right support you have some of these situations some of these issues come up but if that you stay kind of in this you know inner range or whatever you don't really have many issues and that's really comes down to you individually and working with you to figure that out yeah i would love to see you yeah if you have any of these concerns or questions yeah come on in let's do the testing would love to see you absolutely number one you are not alone you have hope there is help we have ways we can get into this and help you find treatment so don't don't suffer in silence come in and, yeah. and let's get this figured out yes love to see you all right we'll catch you in the next episode okay bye, bye.